Leadership Academy, which our church hosts here every summer. And she's the founder of New Mexico Black History Month, an annual month-long celebration of black history and contributions, which is happening right now. Uh, this month includes um, an analysis of the movie 13 and exhibit at the African American Performing Arts Center on the way black businesses have shaped our city. Uh, something called Bed Talks, that's black TED Talks. <laughs> it's not what you thought. <laughs> By the way, Maria Erin Jones, she's our, one of our um, facility hosts here at First Unitarian, and she is giving one of those bed talks. And she's also a host of a podcast that's going to be recorded here at the church in the social hall on Wednesday at 7 p.m. It's the City on the Edge podcast, and they are doing a, a show on the history of black Americans in New Mexico. So those are just a few of the things that are happening uh, during this Black History Month, and you can uh, Google Black History Month or look it up on Facebook um, for New Mexico and find more of the times and locations of all those things. Kathy obviously is a leader. She is um, so active in helping to dismantle racism and teach multiculturalism. She is a mentor to youth and a friend and a mentor to me. And we're just so glad to have you back, Kathy. How y'all doing this morning? You know, it's February and, and I'm here again. <laughs> I'm blessed to be standing before you, though, in this, this beautiful sacred space. I absolutely love this church. And, and I always have to preface my remarks by giving a, a shout out to my two sisters whom, uh, with whom I have a womance. You guys have heard of bromance, but this is a womance. And I have to say that I absolutely love my sister, friend, and neighbor, Susan Peck, who's doing an amazing job with this choir. Isn't she wonderful? Yeah. <laughs> and Reverend Angela Herrera in the Herrera era. And <laughs> I truly believe that Reverend Angela is capable of leading this church, this city, and this state to higher heights and a greater understanding of how we do good and how we do social justice all the time, even when it's difficult. And to all of you in this church, especially to the members of the choir, you sounded so lovely this morning, I want to thank you for your financial and in-kind contributions to me and to the New Mexico Black History Organizing Committee, the organization that I founded uh, for us to be able to continue our, our work. We are definitely in this thing together, and you have shown me that in every way possible, and I want you to know that I'm grateful. I'm certain, however, that it has not escaped anyone's notice that Every time I stand up here, I'm talking to you about social justice and equity and inclusion. It, it can be a little messy talking about these matters because quite frankly, it's a little bit uncomfortable. And you might say, really, Kathy? Really, Kathy, do we, do we have to talk about it again? <laughs> and the answer is, wait for it, yes. <laughs> Yes, we have to talk about it again and again and again and again and again and again and again until we get it right. The very freedoms upon which this country is founded are at stake. But you say, did, did you have to name your talk, Shut Up and Sing? <laughs> After all, you are a singer, aren't you? Can't we just, Kathy, can't we just compliment you on your singing without you complaining? The answer is yes, I am a singer. And yes, you can. But is that all I am to you? I cannot tell you how many times I have shown up to a meeting in other areas of my professional life and people greet me with, hey, Kathy, are you going to sing for us today? 
And while I'm certain that many view it as a compliment or as a way of celebrating my performing talent, it is often used as a way to label me and to stereotype me as a black woman whose primary worth is to entertain. Just a few days ago, an anchor on Fox News had this to say about LeBron James and Kevin Durant. Unlike me, NBA superstar LeBron James has been very outspoken against our president's policies. I haven't done that. But <laughs> taking offense, the Fox News anchor said about him, and I quote, must they run their mouths like that? Unfortunately, a lot of kids and some adults take these ignorant comments seriously. Look, there might be a, a cautionary lesson in LeBron for kids. This is what happens when you attempt to leave high school a year early to join the NBA. And it's always unwise to seek political advice from someone who gets paid $100 million a year to bounce a ball. Oh, and LeBron and Kevin, you're great players, but no one voted for you. Millions elected Trump to be their coach. So keep the political commentary to yourself. Or as someone once said, shut up and dribble. I could not have made that up. <laughs> While my example pales in comparison to this vitriol, and I truly hope that everybody in this room is appalled by those remarks. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. But we've got to admit that as long as these kinds of attitudes prevail, all of us lose. And don't get me wrong, I appreciate the fact that people recognize and celebrate my talent. But I'd ask you to dig a little deeper with me today as we work to accept our own personal responsibility for creating a path to true multiculturalism. In order to do this, we must examine our own implicit associations and biases that shape this world that we live in together. The theme of this year's New Mexico Black History Festival is One New Mexico. I picked the theme because I would really like to see the day when I could pick up the paper, turn on the TV, and hear that New Mexico is number one in education <laughs> and economic development and, and, and last in the race in, in the, the incidences of crime and, and the incidences of childhood poverty. I'd love to hear that New Mexico is focusing on creating an environment that, that works for everyone, regardless of race or socioeconomic status. But unfortunately, we have a long way to go. The justice we seek and, and the freedom we crave seems just beyond our reach. It's really frustrating because every day we, we, we keep having the same conversation over and over again. It's like it's perpetual Groundhog Day in New Mexico. It's almost like we wake up and every day is February 2nd and Punxsutawney Phil sees his shadow and we're committed to another year, another four years of, of dysfunction and being at the top of every bad list and the bottom of every good one. I suggest to you that the way forward is for each one of us to take a really hard look at how we personally contribute to perpetuating Groundhog Day in the political, social, and cultural landscape of this state and of this nation. We have personal responsibility. Dan Smith, a peace researcher, an author of the State of the World Atlas told us that as we encounter each other, we see our diversity of background, race, ethnicity, belief, and how we handle that diversity 
will have much to say about whether we will, in the end, be able to rise successfully to the challenges we face today. Indeed, our futures are inextricably bound. No man is an island. The Pledge of Allegiance to the state flag of New Mexico recognizes this. The pledge says, I salute the flag of the state of New Mexico, the Zia symbol of perfect friendship among united cultures. If each one of us could internalize that pledge and, and really start to take it seriously, just think what New Mexico could look like. Just think what this room would look like. Unfortunately, we keep missing the mark. Why is that? And what can we do about it? The solutions to the problems that we face as a society begin and end with each one of us. There are four steps that I want to outline here that we can personally implement that do not require an act of Congress or the investment of any money. If we do them, we can create powerful change and it is up to us. The first one is that we must be willing to look at our own bias. I will suggest that this is an area where all of us need daily improvement and hypervigilant focus. Some people are explicitly racist, sexist, classist, and or homophobic, and they just don't care. However, implicit bias, hear me when I say this, implicit bias is a huge problem too. Implicit bias refers to a sneakier attitudes or stereotypes that we hold, but we're not generally aware of. We have a tendency to keep looking at things in the comfort of our own limiting points of view. Your explicit belief might be that everyone is equal, but you may find yourself reacting inconsistently. I include myself in that. I'm aware of the fact that I have my own bias. A few years ago, I wrote a show, a one woman show that I very cleverly called One Woman. <laughs> I was pretty proud of it and then one night after, after my show, this woman came up to me and she said, Kathy, I think you're prejudiced. And I told her in no uncertain terms that this was my story and that she was not allowed to tell me how I should frame it. She particularly took offense to a vignette that I wrote about my perspective of O.J. Simpson's acquittal in one of the contro most controversial murder trials in the history of our nation. I will acknowledge that I missed an opportunity to learn more about why she held that position. And I also missed an opportunity to educate her a little bit more about why I said what I said. It was brave of her to come up and speak to me and I would not entertain it. I sent her away and from that day to this, I've seen that woman many times and she has never spoken to me again. I got it wrong. I could have benefited from adding more data to informing my opinion about what I said. And the truth is that in the same situation, we could all benefit from more information. Joseph Godfrey Sachs was an American poet who retold a Hindu parable in a poem called The Blind Men and the Elephant that beautifully demonstrates what happens when we don't have enough information to make an informed decision. It was six men of Indostan, to learning much inclined, who went to see the elephant, though all of them were blind, that each by observation might satisfy his mind. The first approached the elephant, and happening to fall against his broad and sturdy side, at once began to bawl, God bless me, but the elephant is very like a wall. The second feeling of the tusk cried, ho, oh, what have we here? 
So very round and smooth and sharp, to me tis mighty clear. This wonder of an elephant is very like a spear. The third approached the animal and happening to take the squirming trunk within his hands, thus boldly up and spake, I see, quoth he, this elephant is very like a snake. The fourth reached out his eager hand and felt above the knee. What most this wondrous beast is like is mighty plain, quoth he. Tis clear enough, the elephant is very like a tree. The fifth who chanced to touch the ear said, e'en the blindest man can tell what this resembles most. Deny the fact who can, this marvel of an elephant is very like a fan. The sixth no sooner had begun about the beast to grope than seizing on the swinging tail that fell within his scope. I see, quoth he said, this elephant is very like a rope. And so these men of Indostan disputed loud and long, each in his own opinion, exceeding stiff and strong, though each was partly in the right. And all, all, all were in the wrong. The moral of this story is, so oft in theologic wars, the disputants I ween rail on in utter ignorance of what each other mean and prayed about an elephant that none of them have seen. The first step to solving any problem is to gather as much information as possible from every side of the issue in order to make an informed judgment. We have to want to understand. Understanding does not necessarily mean that we'll always agree, but it will definitely get us closer to common ground. In fact, instead of a complete standoff, we would possibly be able to identify areas of agreement and agree to disagree on the remaining portions of any particular challenge we face. Number two, work hard to see differences in people as individuals and not as a group. Please, 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 pretty please, never say that you are colorblind. In fact, when you do, it means that you are marginalizing the lived experiences of someone who is different than you. It's really okay to notice that I am a black woman. I, I am. <laughs> Denying me or anyone their racial identity is not progress, but rather harkens back to this country's sordid racist history. Slavery depended on severing cultural ties. The Indian boarding school movement had similarly de devastating effects on indigenous peoples. The key here is that, that you must work hard to take away the racial charge that you identify with me as a black woman. I mean, I'm intimidating. I'm emasculating. I'm strong. I and sing. I just saw an interview with a woman from the Asian American Association here in Albuquerque in commemoration of Chinese New Year. She talked about her native traditions and the desire to be seen as a Chinese American with strong New Mexican roots. I listened with great interest because I felt like we were saying exactly the same thing. The reason that I started New Mexico Black History Organizing Committee was so that we could understand in a very real way that black history is American history. We don't just celebrate or talk about our history in the month of February, although we are grateful for these set aside times to commemorate our heroes and sheroes. Carter G. Woodson, considered to be the founder of black history, wrote in The Miseducation of the Negro, we should emphasize not Negro history, but the Negro in history. What we need is not a history of selected races or nations, but the history of the world void of national bias, race hate, and religious prejudice. You are an individual. I am an individual 
recognizing this, is the next step to getting us closer to multiculturalism. And I'll just give you permission if you don't like me because you don't like me, that's okay. <laughs> Number three, identify situations where your implicit biases affect your behavior. This affects us in our courtrooms, in our classrooms, in the police cars. Gender bias is, is one great example of those implicit biases. How many women were taught to change a tire or repair a vehicle? I see one, couple hands, few hands. How many times do we expect women to be good cooks? And, and how much time have you spent teaching your young boys to bake cookies? Have you ever found yourself inspecting the grocery cart of an overweight person thinking, man, she should really put those Twinkies back on the shelf? <laughs> One of the things I would ask you to do is to make a list of these areas where you have those implicit biases and where you expect people to do something because of a stereotype that you hold. But be warned, I have no desire to learn how to change a tire. You can still do that for me. <laughs> but I wonder how many times we expect females to be bad at math or for someone of Asian descent to be good what if we change our expectations? I can promise you that it would have an effect in our school system. I encounter young black boys every day that I want to take home with me who have been labeled as special ed or emotionally disturbed. It will change the course of their lives. And we try to get each and every one of them and show them that your life has value, that you are somebody, you are important. Finally, number four, seek out people who are different than you. We live such homogenous lives. Sometimes it's more comfortable, but I'm, I'm challenging you today to get out of your comfort zone and explore a new way of being. I don't care how old you are, or how frightening, frightening it might be, you can expand your circle and learn more about other cultures around you. Make a point to do something every day. Even just act friendlier and acknowledge people when you see them in your everyday life. Like so many things, this requires a plan and we gotta think it out. Now, I'm not encouraging you to go out and stalk someone saying, please, let me be your friend. <laughs> what I'm suggesting is that you have the power to demystify this whole racial divide just by taking the first step. If you see something, say something. Represent me, even if I'm not in the room. And speak to me when you see me on the street. Not everybody is going to wind up being best friends, and that's okay. But make an effort to broaden your knowledge and your associations. We can do this. None of this is rocket science. It completely lies, the complexity completely lies in our unwillingness to see with our hearts and to love. Our greatest challenge is to love. But if we can agree to take personal responsibility to love one another, we will no longer be able to tolerate the injustices that occur on a daily basis in our society. We won't allow someone to tell LeBron James that he can't speak and to shut up and dribble. And the day each one of us takes one more step towards love will be the day we can proudly salute the flag of the state of New Mexico. I salute the flag of the state of New Mexico, the Zia symbol of perfect friendship among united cultures. I can just see the headlines now. New Mexico number one in education. New Mexico number one in social justice. New Mexico number one in love. And every single one of us who accepts this personal challenge we'll be able to stand together and say, hey, I did that. I did that. We did that. And so it is. Thank you.